Hello, everyone. My name is Avery Weinman. I am the UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies Harry C. Sigmund Graduate Fellow and a PhD student here in the Department of History at UCLA. I want to welcome you all to today's event, today, to today's event which is hosted by the UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies and by our co-sponsors, the UCLA Department of History, the UCLA Levy Center for Jewish Studies, and the UCLA Center for Near Eastern Studies. I also want to mention today that we're welcoming a very international audience. And we have guests from Canada, China, Turkey, Israel, Austria, the United States, Brazil, Ukraine, and Tunisia. Today, we are fortunate enough to be joined by Professor Or Yehudai to discuss his book, Leaving Zion, Jewish Emigration from Palestine and Israel after World War II. Professor Yehudai is an assistant professor of history and the Schottenstein Chair of Israel Studies at the Ohio State University. His book, Leaving Zion, focuses on the significant yet largely understudied history of Jews who migrated out of British Mandatory Palestine and, after 1948, out of the state of Israel. In Leaving Zion, Professor Yehudai puts emigration waves in context of larger global patterns, but without losing the individual voice and essence of each individual migrant. Of course, Professor Yehudai himself will go into further detail as to what the book is about, but before that, I want to quickly explain to the audience how today's event will work. So first, Professor Yehudai is going to give a lecture on the book, and then in the last 10 or 15 minutes of the event, we will open up the floor to questions from you, the audience, for a Q&A. And with that, I want to hand it over to you, Professor Yehudai, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Avery, for this very generous introduction. I also want to thank the Nazarian Center uh, for inviting me, for the opportunity to present uh, my work. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, everyone, for, for joining us uh, today. So uh, the material that I'll be presenting today obviously comes from uh, uh, the book uh, that Avery already uh, mentioned uh, on Jewish outmigration from Palestine and Israel between 1945 and the early 1960s. Now, a lot has been written on Jewish immigration into the country, into, into Palestine and Israel during that period. But my book looks at the movement in the opposite uh, direction. And the book combines two different uh, levels of narrative. It tells the story from the perspective of the migrants themselves, looking at the reasons for their decision to leave, uh, to leave the country, to leave, to leave Israel, um, looking at the obstacles that they faced during the migration process, and also what happened to them after arriving to their new destinations. And then another level of narrative is the public and institutional uh, side of the story. Um, so the book investigates migration policies in Israel and in countries of destination, and the discourse on immigration in Israel and in the larger Jewish world, and also in other countries uh, into which migrants from Israel uh, arrived. The broader question that the book uh, tries to answer is what was the role of Zionism and the state of Israel in the post-war world, in the years following the Second World War, especially in the lives of Jews who were uprooted by the events of the period. And in the book, I draw on the theoretical assumption that looking at the conditions surrounding the departure of immigrants helps to understand the political, ideological, and social conflicts involved in the nation building process, because out migration, much like immigration, defines the outer boundaries of the state. And this means that those who choose to cross the boundaries may put themselves in conflict with the national project. And because of national anxieties, national fears of loss, the departure of, of immigrants um, may be seen. Oh, maybe, I didn't sorry, get the name of the app. Maybe treated, Please try again. The departure of immigrants may be treated as deviant or even traitorous as an act of, of treason. These are general observations, but they are highly relevant to Jewish immigration from Palestine and Israel because Jews who left the country acted against the expectations of the national community, which defined the land of Israel as the only home of all Jews and rejected Jewish life in the diaspora as pointless and untenable. Now, since the Zionist movement emerged in, emerged in Europe, but saw Palestine or the land of Israel as its homeland, the entire realization of the Zionist project was based on Jewish immigration 
into the ancestral homeland, into Palestine. Um, but even beyond the practical goal of moving people, people from one place to another, Jewish immigration to the land of Israel was also deeply ingrained in nationalist ideals. Immigration was regarded as a process of individual transformation that required Jews to leave behind them what was perceived as the negative features of their old diaspora identity. Those negative features in Zionist rhetoric included, for example, the weakness of Jews in the face of anti-Jewish hostility, the passivity of, their, of the Jews and their uprootedness. So they had to leave behind them all those negative features and recreate themselves as new Jews who would be strong, proud, independent, and deeply rooted in the, uh, in the ancient homeland. Now let me share uh, my screen to screen to uh, give you to show you the a visual illustration of that uh, process. You, you will see um, an illustration of the image of the of the new Jew, the new Jews, men and women, who again proud, strong, and rooted uh, rooted in uh, in the land. Here is another example, which also provides the contrast between the image of the new Jew on the left and the image of the old diaspora Jew. You can see the uh, Jewish. Uh, person here chained to the diaspora and longing to the land of Israel. So due to the practical and ideological significance of immigration for Zionism, emigration, the movement in the opposite direction, was understood as a threat to the success of the Zionist project and was described in terms such as catastrophe, social disease, collective psychosis, and even suicide. Emigration was also attrib attributed to ideological and personal weakness and lack of moral and physical stamina. According to the traditional Zionist narrative, those who left, Jews who left the country, did so because they could not withstand the rigors of pioneering life in Israel or because they were too selfish to dedicate themselves to the collective national enterprise. Emigrants were seen as a problematic group of deviators and even traitors who represented the counter type of the ideal national type which the Zionist movement tried to create. And here again, we can see uh, in those images, um, those images give us a sense of the difference between the counter type and the ideal national type in Zionist discourse. And the presence, the presence of immigrants as counter types helped to forge and reinforce the new national identity. Now, those ideas, of, of course, also reflected in the terminology. Many of you are familiar with those terms. Um, so, um, uh, aliyah, meaning ascend in Hebrew, is the Zionist uh, Hebrew term for Jewish immigration to Israel. Yehida, or ascend, is the Zionist term for Jewish emigration from Israel. Immigrants are olim, those who go up, um, immigrants into Israel. And immigrants from Israel are yodim, those who go now, how significant was this migration movement? As you can see here, between 1945 and 1967, almost 190,000 Jews left Palestine and Israel. And this was about 40%, 14% of the number of immigrants, Jewish immigrants who had come to the country uh, during that period. My main focus is on the years of the massive Jewish immigration to Israel, the period between 1948 and 1953 when the Jewish population of the country was more than doubled by the arrival of around 700,000 new Jewish immigrants, mainly from Europe and from the Muslim world. Now, to understand the magnitude of this immigration, just imagine that the US would receive about 600 million new immigrants in a period of uh, about three years. And we also have to, to remember that, that most of these immigrants were poor people, uh, they had no, no, most of them did not have any financial assets. They were poor people. And also that the state itself was young and lacked the resources needed to absorb all those immigrants. This is an image of a transit camp or immigrant camp um, in which many of the migrants in Israel uh, were living during the, the, the period. Just to give you a sense of the conditions surrounding immigration and immigration. So it is not surprising that the majority of immigrants or those who left the country 
were new immigrants who had come to Israel after 1948 in this massive wave of immigration. Around 75 75% of the immigrants had come to Israel from Europe, so there was a clear majority of uh, European or Ashkenazi Jews among the emigrating uh, population, among, among those living in the country. We can also see that uh, the main destination was the United, was the United States. 31% of all immigrants went to the, to the United States. 42% went to all countries in Europe and much smaller, smaller numbers went to the Middle East and to North Africa. Um, immigration to uh, Europe and to the Middle East and North Africa was mainly return migration of people who had come to Israel from those regions and emigration to the United States and to the Americas more generally was for the most part um, um, not return migration, but resettlement in uh, a new destination. Now, among all those immigrants, there was one group of a few thousand people that attracted considerable amount of attention during the 1950s and caused an especially painful embarrassment for Israel. This group was comprised of people who had immigrated to Israel from Eastern European countries and from displaced persons or DP camps in Europe after 1948, maybe. Um, here we can see a map of the displaced persons uh, camps in Europe. Those were camps that, that, that uh, th those were facilities that were created and managed by, by the allies and by UN agencies to provide shelter uh, to people who had been uh, displaced by the war, including, of course, uh, Jewish survivors of the Nazi genocide who lived in those camps uh, until they were able to settle in new destinations. Here we can see uh, Jewish DPs um, expressing their desire to go to Israel after, uh, after the war, and here we can see um, 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 refugees trying to reach the shores of Palestine. Now, although these immigrants had gone to Israel, they did not see their future in the Jewish state. And after various time periods, ranging from several months to a few years, they decided to re-migrate. Most of them wanted to go to the United States or to Canada, but due to technical reasons, they could not get there directly from Israel, and they had to use Europe as a stepping stone uh, to their desired destination, destinations. Now, most of them could not realize their immigration plans even after arriving in Europe, and they ran into serious economic and legal troubles in their countries of destination, mainly in Germany, Austria, France, and Italy. Those stranded, stranded migrants refused to return to Israel and became dependent on assistance from local Jewish communities and Jewish and non-Jewish aid organizations and relief societies. For many stranded migrants, the only solution was return to refugee life, which they tried to achieve by settling in DP camps in Germany and in Austria. So some of those people had come to Israel from those DP camps in Europe, in Germany, and then after leaving Israel, they again, again entered into those uh, DP camps. Most of the DP camps had been closed by 1951, following immigration, out-migration of DPs from the camps, many to Israel and to the United States. But there was one camp, the Ferenwald camp near Munich, that existed until 1957, because it housed the so-called hardcore DPs, the sick and disabled survivors who could not or did not want to emigrate from the camps. So this camp continued to exist until 1957, 12 years after the end of the Second World War, um, a refugee camp, the displaced persons camp in Germany still existed. And this camp also, be, also became a magnet, sort of a point of attraction for Jewish migrants from Israel. The migrants from Israel, the re-migrants from Israel, gravitated towards the camp in the hope of receiving welfare and immigration assistance from Jewish organizations and local authorities, local German authorities, who were providing uh, this assistance to the original DP uh, population in the camp, those who were living in the, in the camp since the end of the war. Both inside and outside Fernwald and other camps, the main body to which immigrants from Israel turned for help was the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, committee the, uh, also called also the, the Joint or JDC, the Joint 
was established in 1914 by American Jews to extend help to Jews around the world. Over the years, it developed into the world's largest Jewish philanthropic organization. The joint was also the most important Jewish body operating in Europe after the war. Many of the migrants had been supported by the joint before going to Israel. So when they returned to Europe, they expected the joint to again become their main source of support. But the joint could not fulfill the expectations. The joint had invested considerable funds and efforts in diminishing the Jewish refugee problem in Europe by sending refugees to new destinations, mainly to Israel. And since Israel was considered as the main country for resettlement of Jewish refugees, it was the official policy of the joint not to assist those leaving the country and returning to Europe. The migrants did not accept this position. They protested by staging sit-in strikes at the offices of the joint, of the joint in Europe and by sending letters to the press, to newspapers, and to Jewish organizations. In those letters, they, com they complained that the joint was discriminating against them because they had left Israel. One immigrant who had fought in the 1948 Arab-Israeli war in Palestine was, and, and was now part of a group that got stranded in Rome, in Italy, on their way to Canada, wrote the following letter to one American Jewish organization. Now let, let's, see, let's see the content of that letter. Strangely enough, I'm not treated like an outcast by the people I fought for. Why? Because I left Israel, I cannot send the climate down there. Apart from that, is the policy of the joint to, is the policy of the joint to force people to go back to Israel, right? Not every American lives in America, not every Frenchman in France, and not every Englishman in England. I fought in Israel for two years under the worst conditions. Those people of the joint have never seen the country and talk. They ought to go down there themselves for at least two days before they condemn others. So this is just one example of the attempts of migrants to draw attention to their plight. The migrants became a headache not only for Jewish organizations, but also for local authorities, mainly in Germany. The Germans were determined to close the DP camps and terminate the Jewish refugee problem in Germany. But the influx from Israel into the camps went counter to these efforts, especially in Camp Ferenwald. German officials negotiated with representatives of Jewish bodies in order to find various solutions to the crisis, especially through resettlement in uh, other countries. But the Germans also took police action against migrants, including imprisonment and deportation from the country. And this included deportation to Israel, which represented one of the ironies, one of the historical ironies uh, of this uh, story. The forced expulsion of Holocaust, Jewish Holocaust survivors from Germany to Israel only several, several years after 1945. All these events took place in Europe, but they brought reactions from the American Jewish community. The American Jewish community funded the relief activity uh, in uh, Europe of organizations like the Joint and others. And public opinion among American Jews was divided. Some supported the migrants and accused the Joint of rejecting appeals for help on account of political considerations. The Jewish newsletter, which was a, a journal uh, anti-Zionist uh, journal based in New York argued, for example, that re-migrants from Israel were quote-unquote looked upon with contempt and hatred by the Zionist and pro-Zionist relief organizations which, which denied them assistance in order to force them to go back to Israel. This is one example of the uh, criticism that was uh, directed uh, at the joint uh, by the supporters of the migrants. On the other hand, there were those who believed that the Jewish world owed nothing to immigrants from Israel. Some letters to the editor of the Jewish uh, Daily Forward, which was an important uh, Yiddish newspaper in New York, um, argued that Jews who had suffered under the Nazis and had been sent to Israel with the help of money provided by American Jews 
should endure the hardships of life in Israel and not return to the land of their persecutors in Germany. And those returning, it was argued, should not receive, should not expect to receive any, any public support. A writer in one American Zionist uh, journal accused the migrants in Germany of reversing the process and transforming the historic return to the land of Israel into the degradation of the returnee or the re-migrant to Germany. This writer insisted that the Jewish people had no obligation towards the migrants who were the creators of their own misery. This is how she described it. The pressure by the migrants and their supporters uh, in the Jewish uh, press, but also maybe the tendency, the natural tendency of relief officers to assist people in need, often compelled the joint to deviate from its declared policy and assist, assist migrants in uh, migrants from Israel. But the joint could not adopt a firm policy because it's constant, it constantly had to choose between two bad options. On the one hand, refusing assistance to migrants would aggravate their hardships and magnify the problem. On the other hand, it was clear that providing assistance would encourage more movement from Israel of people who would be driven by the hope of relying on this assistance. And the joint finally concluded that the only way out of this dilemma was to influence the Israeli government to curb the movement from Israel to Europe. So in November 1953, one of the directors of the joint traveled to Israel uh, to meet with key Israeli decision makers and convey to them the gravity of the problem. As a result of these meetings, it became clear to authorities in Israel that immigration from the country was creating serious complications in Europe and became a political embarrassment for Israel. The Israelis decided to take several steps to confront the disorganized departure from the country. The government, first of all, restricted the distribution of exit permits, permits and uh, passports in a way that would limit immigration and would also minimize the, the, chances, the chances that immigrants would get stuck uh, on their way or face legal and economic difficulties after leaving Israel. It's important to note that during that period, immigration, uh, people wanted to leave the country had to apply for an exit uh, permit. So the authorities used their, their ability to regulate uh, departure in order to make sure that people uh, uh, would not face all those uh, troubles uh, on their uh, way. The Israeli government also decided that, decided that new immigrants wishing to leave the country would not be allowed to do so unless they refund the state for the value of material benefits they had received upon immigration to Israel. In some cases, prospective immigrants were even required to repay the costs involved in bringing them into Israel and maintaining them in immigrant reception camps in Israel, the camps, that, camps like uh, we saw at the beginning. And this was a serious, serious uh, obstacle uh, for immigration because many people could not uh, afford uh, paying those costs. They could not repay the Israel, the government, the amounts that the government had uh, invested in bringing them into Israel. And the government also launched a propaganda campaign against immigration in the, in the newspapers, in the press. The campaign was based mainly on reports about the hardships of that Israeli immigrants had encountered abroad. As part of this campaign, journalists from Israel traveled to different countries of this nation to collect material on the experiences of, of disappointed immigrants and the stories were later published in the Israeli newspapers with the aim of damping enthusiasm, enthusiasm for immigration. In the words of one, one Israeli official, the purpose of the report was to demonstrate to the Israeli public that no mountains of gold were waiting for them, for them abroad. Most of the reports indeed painted a very gloomy picture of the lives of, of immigrants and highlighted the, their immoralities and personal and financial failures. The propaganda campaign included not only articles, but also cartoons. And here I want to share my screen again. 
So this is an example of one of those uh, uh, cartoons um, showing um, a Holocaust survivor knocking on the closed door of post-war Germany. You can see his uh, bent shoulder and uh, green face, and of course the number uh, on his hand uh, knocking on the door of, uh, of Germany. Um, this cartoon depicts the immigrants as rootless people floating above the globe, carried in the air by their passports. See that the, the passports are their, the wings that carry them in the air. And the suitcases, the Hebrew writing on the suitcase, on the suitcases uh, uh, say, uh, um, say uh, black market, slander of the country, and forgeries. And those were typical accusations against the immigrants. Now, to me, this cartoon evokes Mark Chagall's Luftmensch. Luftmensch, the Yiddish term meaning men of air, which refers to the, to the impractical, overly intellectual uh, person who came to symbolize the rootlessness of the Jew, of the Jews of the diaspora. You can see the uh, similarity. I, mean, I don't know if, the, if Ariana Vaughn, uh, who uh, painted this, this cartoon, uh, had Chagall's, uh, uh, Chagall's painting in mind when he when he painted the, the cartoon, but you can see the similarity between uh, the two images. And this image uh, of the Luftmensch, of course, uh, is the very opposite of the, of the uh, uh, image of the rooted Jew that stood at the center of the Zionist vision. So those cartoons were also part of the propaganda uh, campaign. The anti-immigration anti policies were important in and of themselves and helped to mitigate the crisis in Germany. But the discussions leading up to the decisions were also important because they reveal the views of Israeli officials on a number of issues relating to the immigration problem. Issues like individual freedom versus collective needs, the mental disposition of Jewish migrants, and the relations between Jewish immigrants and the Jewish state. For example, one official named Yoa Yosefton, who was in charge of the immigration enterprise um, in Israel, thought that immigrants were driven to leave the country by, by, by what he called a wandering instinct and lack of mental stability. He believed that new immigrants in Israel should be compelled to endure the, endure the hardships or else many of them would leave. At a meeting of one of the, one of the committees on immigration, Yosefton said that Israel should treat its immigrants the way a social worker treats a client. The state should tell the immigrants, you should stay here because we know better than you what is good for you. Moshe Sharet, the foreign minister, held a similar view. He wrote in his diary that the state cannot comply with the wandering instinct. Again, you see this uh, phrase repeating itself, wandering instinct, is embedded in the heart of these reckless people, must not comply with their forgetfulness of their own past, but rather, should save them from the curse of eternal gypsiness in which they seek relief from the tanks of absorption in their only home in the world. So those statements stress the ostensible uh, old Jewish habit of wandering, which Zionism wanted to eliminate. Golda Meirson, who of course later became Golda Meir, she was then Minister of Labor, referred to immigration candidates as people intent on committing suicide and compared the restrictions, on, the restrictions on immigration to laws against suicide. In her view, Israel was entitled to demand self-sacrifice from Jewish immigrants, and the restrictions on immigration did not violate any concepts of democracy, liberalism, or individual freedom. And this analogy between, between uh, Jewish immigration uh, from Israel and suicide was quite common. It appeared also in other uh, sources. Many observers made comments about the psychological and moral character of the migrants. One American Zionist writer insisted that the decision, decision to leave Israel and settle in refugee camps in Germany was a result of what she called morbid compulsions of Jewish migrants. She wondered whether the migrants were attracted by what she called the womb-like security of the refugee camp. So we see this rhetoric emphasizing uh, um, um, rhetoric from psychology. Um, one Israeli newspaper wrote that by leaving Israel and becoming false refugees in Germany, the immigrants had committed an immoral act which placed them beyond 
the limits of national and religious solidarity. So by leaving Israel and going back to Germany, the immigrants um, excluded themselves from the Jewish community, according to this writer. One notable exception to all these statements was an account by an Israeli journalist who visited one of the German camps where migrants from Israel were residing and concluded that most of them were sound-minded family people, thoughtful and hardworking, serious and cautious. He got the impression that these people had decided to put the wandering stick in their hands again only after long and many deliberations and after encountering unusual difficulties insurmountable for most people. So this is a more positive uh, depiction uh, and assessment of this of these uh, uh, people, uh, but most uh, accounts were much more negative. As all these examples indicate, Jewish immigration from Israel became a controversial public issue not only in Israel, but in a larger Jewish world. The vision of Jewish statehood had not considered the possibility that Israel would become a sending country of needy migrants. The presence of such migrants in Europe, and especially in Germany, provoked intense responses regarding the phenomenon as a whole and regarding the moral character of the migrants and of the bodies with which they came in contact. The migrants challenged two central convictions of the Jewish world after the Second World War. First, that Israel should be a country of Jewish immigration and not emigration. And second, that Jews should not resettle in Germany, what was then called the blood, blood soaked, soaked soil of post war Germany. Jewish immigration from Israel, from Israel, therefore, aroused debates regarding the appropriate attitude towards people who had acted against society's expectations. And since many immigrants demanded material support during the migration process, their presence in Europe posed a conflict between two principles. On the one hand, the traditional Jewish international, the traditional idea of Jewish international solidarity, embodied in the Hebrew phrase, Kol Yisrael Aravim or all Jews are responsible for one another. And on the other hand, the principle of support of Zionism, which became a consensus in the Jewish world in light of what had happened in Hitler's Europe. The conflict between uh, those two values was expressed in the notion that assisting immigrants out of Jewish solidarity would increase immigration, which in turn would undermine the Zionist cause. The dissonance between those two values, which contrast, contrasted political goals with humanitarian commitment, humanitarian obligations, was a source of friction uh, and debates in Jewish diaspora communities in which immigrants from Israel wanted uh, to, uh, to settle. Now, today we normally associate um, divisions over Israel in Jewish communities with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but in the 1950s, several, only several years after the, the Holocaust, there were political and ideological divisions over the place of Israel and Zionism in the uh, experiences of Jewish refugees, especially those who wanted to find homes outside Israel. And yet, the positions of those participating in the debates, both in Israel and in other countries, were often detached from the personal and material considerations that motivated the migrants themselves. Immigrants were mostly driven by issues like climate conditions, health problems, economic distress, the difficulty of learning, learning Hebrew, the desire to reunite with family members abroad, and general feelings of, of alienation in Israel. Usually it was some combination of all, those, of all those motives, as we can learn from the statement of one immigrant who said, I can't stand that country, the climate, the people, everything. But many immigrants were more, more ambivalent in their statements. Immigrants did not, not necessarily reject the idea of a Jewish state, of establishing a Jewish state in Palestine, even if they did not wish to live uh, in that state themselves. It is possible that immigrants frame their decision, decisions to leave Israel around specific and personal issues uh, like uh, climate, health and family needs 
in order to justify their personal uh, choices without denouncing Zionism. They made a distinction between ideological support for Zionism and Israel and their personal choice, the personal aspiration to live in another country. We might say that immigrants try to depoliticize immigration. It's also interesting that some immigrants continue to express a strong connection to Israel many years after leaving the country. This is evident, evident especially in, uh, in accounts that were produced uh, several many years after, or de decades after immigration, uh, for example, in memoirs and oral history interviews. And so, for example, one Holocaust survivors, first survivor who in the, in the 1950s moved from, Poland, moved from Poland to Israel and then to the United States, 40 years later, described Israel as our land, our place, our home. So she used, uh, she referred to Israel not only as her personal home, but as the collective home of the Jewish people. She suffered, suffered economic difficulties and loneliness, loneliness in the United States and said that moving there was the biggest, biggest mistake she had ever made in her life, leaving Israel and moving to the United States. But other people were uh, uh, satisfied with their decision to leave Israel. So uh, there, were a variety, there was a variety of experiences. In any case, while decisions to migrate are usually individual decisions and in migration is an individual act, the historical circumstances of Jewish immigration from the land of Israel after the Second World War dictated that the personal experiences of individual migra migrants were cast into the public domain in which the migrants were seen by many people as social outcasts. The story of Jewish immigration from, from Palestine and Israel demonstrates the, 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 the broader, the larger point of the fuzzy boundaries between the personal and political spheres. In conclusion, in both the academic literature and popular imagination, the creation of Israel is regarded as a rupture of the Jewish past of displacement and wandering. But the experiences of immigrants show that this assumption does not hold true in all cases. The Zionist movement aspired to create a sense of Jewish rootedness and permanence in the soil of the land of Israel and to solve the problem of Jewish homelessness, which was seen as the, sorry, <clears throat> to solve the problem of Jewish homelessness, which was seen as the <clears throat> defining feature of Jewish life in the diaspora, but the story, the story of Jewish immigration from Israel emphasizes continuity rather than change. It tells, it tells us that tens of thousands of Jews saw the land of Israel not as a permanent homeland or a final destination, but as a way station to more desirable lands. As opposed to received opinion, Israel was not only a country of Jewish immigration, but also of emigration. And the image of the wandering Jew maintained a strong presence in the years surrounding, surrounding the creation of Israel, and the specter of displacement hovered over the early years of the state. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Yehudai, for that really fascinating talk. And uh, we have really great questions coming in, but I'm going to use the license that I have, the power that I have as the moderator to get us started. Um, a quick reminder, though, if you do have a question that you'd like, hopefully, to have answered today, please write it in the Q&A function, and we will try and get to as many as we can. But my question is that, in a way, this history is also somewhat autobiographical for you. So you yourself are an Israeli immigrant, or at least have Israeli family. Um, and I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit about your background and how your own background shaped your approach to this project, and also the arguments that you were trying to make when you approached this book. Well, my own my own personal background. So I I uh, uh, left Israel, emigrated from Israel in two thousand six when I started uh, my graduate studies at the University of Chicago, um, and I started this project as a dissertation project in Chicago uh, about two years later. So uh, I don't know if you know the immediate reason was uh, my own experience as an Israeli living in the United States. Um, the idea actually came to me from a, a graduate paper that I wrote in Chicago. Uh, I wrote about the uh, history of a Zionist uh, youth movement 
and I saw letters that the leader of the movement uh, wrote from uh, Palestine to his friends in Europe, and he described a crisis in Palestine in the 1920s, uh, uh, and he said that many people were leaving the country, so I thought this, this, this seemed like an interesting topic, I hadn't read much about, uh, about immigration uh, from, from Palestine, so I decided to, uh, to um, uh, turn this into my uh, dissertation project and then, um, then the book. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of my personal experience, I would say that um, maybe my, my, my own perspective, my own view changed over the years. You know, it takes a lot of time to finish a dissertation and then to finish, to, finish, uh, to finish the book. So maybe when I just left Israel, I was more enthusiastic about living in, in, you know, in other places and maybe more critical of Israel. Um, so I place a lot of emphasis on the voices of immigrants who were, you know, very negative voices, uh, um, criticizing life in Israel and in, in Palestine. And then I think, you know, several things happened in the world, uh, uh, places that I lived. And then, I, you know, I, my view changed a little bit. And then I think that I um, became more open to the more um, ambivalent voices. Um, as, I, as I said uh, towards the end of the lecture, those who also expressed um, you know, connection to Israel um, and even desire to return. So I think that in a way, my, my personal experience met, made the book more, more balanced and rich in terms of the, you know, the variety of voices that I, that I bring, the variety of experiences and attitudes uh, towards, uh, towards Israel. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, our first question from the audience comes from Jerome Vered. Uh, he wants to know, how does some of the emigration relate to the general brain drain trend of educated young people um, to the United States and other countries from countries like Israel um, under socialist governments in kind of the mid to late uh, 20th century? So how do people facing limited economic um, opportunities, but who have really advanced education backgrounds um, deal with that? And how does Israeli emigration for these opportunities fit into global patterns? Yeah, it, it fit into this, into this pattern in the 1950s. Um, I show in the book, I provide a lot, a lot of statistics, and I show that the, uh, the many, many of the, actually the majority of immigrants were not the, uh, from the, you know, the weakest elements of society, but people who had the means to, uh, to live, to emigrate. Um, so professionals, um, you know, doctors, engineers, nurses, teachers, people who had professions, people who had some uh, financial ability to uh, to, you know, to pay for immigration. I talked earlier about the, the, uh, the demand that immigrants should repay the costs of immigrating, immigrating to Israel. So this is also a general phenomenon uh, in immigration. Usually the uh, weakest elements in society uh, uh, do not or tend less to immigrate. The, the presence of, of, the, uh, the, of the weakest people uh, um, um, uh, is not, not very prominent in, in immigrating population because immigration requires financial resources, um, um, initiative, knowledge about immigration opportunities, and also, of course, the ability to, uh, to, uh, um, uh, to start new lives in other, in other places. So um, officials in Israel were worried about, uh, about the fact that uh, those more needed people or stronger elements of society uh, were uh, so prominent in the uh, emigrating uh, population. Um, yeah, I think this, this fits into a, into a general uh, uh, trend. There were, there were complaints about people who uh, um, people who left the country and left um, behind them family relatives, family members who were you know maybe older, uh, sick, uh, and uh, could not, in the view of Israeli officials, could not contribute to Israeli economy as much as those immigrants could contribute. So this was this was a major issue, major concern for. Uh, for the government. Yeah, it's really interesting also to think if there were corollaries perhaps um, for other labor socialist governments, perhaps Soviet Union is the one that comes to mind of like a similar kind of worry about brain drain of really highly educated young people who the state has an interest in actually not, not incentivizing that they emigrate because they have a reason for keeping them within the country. Um, another question comes um, from an anonymous member of the audience which is at what point did the state's attitude, meaning the state of Israel towards emigration soften or change if it softened or changed? Yes, so it, it did change. Um, so first of all, um, 
the uh, restrictions that I introduced, that I, that I described uh, in the 1950s, helped to, uh, uh, to mitigate the crisis in Germany, uh, in Europe. Uh, and then towards the late 1950s, uh, some of the res restrictions were removed. Uh, because people uh, do not will no longer not, no longer experience those those hardships, uh, you know, of getting stranded in Euro Europe and living in those refugee camps. Um, towards the nineteen the late nineteen fifties, immigration became a more normal phenomenon of people who would just you know move from Israel mainly to the United States and to Canada. Um, so there was no longer need uh, uh, to you know to maintain those uh, restrictions, and then. In the mid 1960s, also the, there was no longer uh, the, the government no longer required people to apply for an exit permit. So I said earlier that in order to leave the country, not only, not not necessarily not necessarily to emigrate, also uh, temporary uh, uh, departure uh, was dependent upon um, um, uh, exit permit from the authorities, and this this was eliminated in 19, uh, mid 1960s, and generally. Gradually, the idea of immigration, you know, of the fact that people of Jews, uh, generally of Israelis, would live in other countries, uh, became more accept more acceptable. There was more openness towards uh, towards the, this uh, uh, this idea, this notion of immigration from Israel, of Jewish life outside of the country. Um, of course, the propaganda campaign was also um, also lasted for two years, I think, uh, in the in 1950s. Um, so the uh, this restrictive attitude, those restrictive policies uh, did not uh, uh, continue beyond the, uh, the 19, uh, uh, mid 1960s. Um, and then also the rhetoric on immigration changed gradually. Since the 1970s, 1980s, I would say, um, there was more openness towards, again, towards the idea of the Jews would, would leave Israel and, leave and, and start new lives in other, in other countries. Although um, we do see, uh, uh, some element of continuity uh, today. This is more not 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 uh, regarding the actual restrictions, um, but the, the discourse on immigration. So you would still see, even though you know immigrants today are not described as Yodim, um, this you know negative, uh, ideologically charged uh, term was replaced by more more neutral terms such as just immigrants, Um and uh, they're not considered as, as traitors anymore, generally. But still, you know, from time to time, the uh, migration problem would, you know, the migration debate would be uh, is revived uh, in the press, and there are still articles um, and people, you know, uh, articles published on the issue, and people, and some of the some of the some writers would express similar opinions to, to opinions that uh, that were expressed in the 1950s um, against immigration. Um, especially to Germany, uh, uh, and many Israelis today live in Berlin. So, so we see a combination of continuity and change. On the one hand, um, no more, no more uh, restrictions, and, and we don't see these harsh, uh, uh, those harsh responses, and the more, more openness towards the idea of immigration. But on the other hand, when uh, when the debate is revived, you can still see see uh, uh, some of the older arguments, older. The sentiments that are being expressed again even today. We have another question from Gary Gilbert, uh, which is members of uh, UN's GUP, uh, the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine, uh, visited some of the DP camps. Did leaders of the Yeshuv attempt to quote unquote coach uh, the Jews that were living in the camps on developing a stronger desire to immigrate to, to immigrate to Israel or on what to say to the UN's GUP representatives? So the question is whether Zionists uh, from Israel uh, try to, to influence people to Jews for, to go from the DP camps to Israel to, to Palestine. Correct. I think the question is: Did the Zionist emissaries go to DP camps um, and attempt to instill amongst the refugees living there a real desire to move to Israel? And if so, how did they tell these refugees living in these camps to respond to the UNSCOP uh, members who were going around and interviewing people in the camps at the same kind of general time after the Second World War? Yeah, definitely. So uh, first of all, there was a. Um, it was not just going into Israel, it was also uh, a campaign to recruit GPs from the camps to serve in the Israeli army, to, to participate in the 1948 war. Um, so this was, um, this, this of course involved immigration to Israel, but uh, the context was uh, uh, joining the Israeli army, the Haganah, and then the Israeli army in the 1948 war. 
uh, and there was a campaign. The Zionists uh, did a campaign in, in the DP camps. Uh, it was quite aggressive, uh, actually. Um, there was there was there was a, you know social pressure was put on the on people who were more hesitant who did not want to join um, um, the army, did not want to to go uh, to Israel. In, even some sanctions uh, in some cases, so uh, sources uh, indicating that. Uh, um, in some cases, social benefits were denied from uh, Jews in the DP camps who did not want to um, join the army and immigrate uh, to Israel. Um, so this had some some influence on the desire of, I mean, on the on the choices of of DPs, Jewish DPs in the camps. Although, even regardless of those campaigns, the majority of DPs of Jewish DPs did want to did prefer to go to Israel. Um, at least this is the, what they, they, I mean, there, there were uh, surveys uh, conducted uh, in the DP camps and uh, they found that the majority of immigrants support, the majority of DPs supported uh, Zionism and preferred to immigrate to Israel. Um, at least this is, what, this is what they said and the, the general atmosphere of in the DP camps was pro-Zionist, uh, which was partly a result of the um, campaign of Zionist emissaries that came there from, from Palestine. But also the reaction of, of the DPs themselves, who uh, probably believed that the uh, best solution, you know, for their displacement um, uh, was Zionism. Um, um, so yeah, so a combination of uh, uh, of social pressure and the more natural reaction of, of Holocaust survivors who thought that the, the future the future was uh, was in immigration to Israel. I'm not sure I remember remember the second part of the question. I think I answered only the first part, but. The second part of the question was whether the Zionist officials who were in these camps were giving specific kind of coaching lines to the Jews who lived there um, when they engaged with people who were emissaries from the United Nations. Yeah, so I mean the general uh, encouragement to uh, to go to Israel. Yeah, and also pressure. We have another question from Alon Tam, who's the postdoc scholar here at the Nazarian Center this year who says, thank you for your fascinating lecture and wonders if you can talk a little bit about the Mizrahim uh, who emigrated back to their countries of origin um, in, after 1948. And I have a similar question to this, which is, were there more geographically specific patterns um, between Jews who are broadly encompassed by the acronym MENA, right, Middle East and North Africa? But is there things that were specific only to Jews from North Africa, things that were specific only to the Middle East? So to reiterate and kind of resynthesize those in general, um, what were the patterns amongst Mizrahi Jews who wanted to emigrate after 1948? And then my question is, is there greater specificity kind of within the umbrella of Mizrahim or Middle East and North African? Yeah, so those are important questions. I actually have a special section in, in, the, in the book on uh, Mizrahim and the differences and similarities between Mizrahim and Ashkenazim in terms of immigration. So first of all, as we saw in the, uh, as I saw, as I showed in the beginning, the majority of immigrants were Ashkenazim. Um, I don't remember the, the, the numbers, but I think that about seventy-five of percent of the immigrants were uh, Ashkenazi uh, Jews. Um, the uh, the main reason for that, I think, was that most of the, of the immigrants wanted to go to Canada and to the United States, and in order to go to those countries, um, immigration to those countries required. Uh, sponsorship by family family uh, members or family relatives, uh, and because of previous immigration immigrations, many to the Jewish migrations, many to the United States, but also to Canada, uh, more Ashkenazi Jews had relatives uh, in those countries who could uh, sponsor immigration the immigration immigration from Israel. Um, so this was uh, one reason. Um, it was also, of course, difficult to get to go back to. Uh, some countries in, in, in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, although if you look at the comparison between patterns of, of immigration, we see that in the earlier years, until 1951, the uh, rates of return to the country of origin was higher among Middle Eastern and, and North African Jews than among European Jews. So European Jews tended not to return to Eastern Europe, but to go to the United States and Canada, and North African Jews mainly tended to go back to uh, to the countries of origin, to uh, many Morocco. Uh, so this was one one difference, and uh, a quite small number of of, uh, of North African and and, uh, uh, and uh, Middle Eastern Jews emigrated from Israel to the Americas, to the United States, uh, 
and and to Canada. Maybe Canada, Canada maybe more, but less to the United States. Um, now, the, this this question was discussed the, by the uh, the uh, authorities in Israel, officials uh, who uh, discussed immigration, also related to this question of the difference between uh, Ashkenazi and Mizrahi uh, Jews, um, and some some uh, some argued that. Um, um, some, some actually could not understand why uh, people return, would return to countries in the Middle East. Uh, there was a quote by Moshe Sharet who expressed, expressed, you know, inability to understand why people would, would, from Israel would, uh, would, would return uh, to Iran, for example, while immigration to uh, back to Europe uh, was seen as more, you know, more understandable from his from their uh, perspective. Um, but. We also see that uh, now, you know, this uh, connects to your question that the patterns of immigration, the differences in patterns of, of immigration, were not only not always uh, related to the differences between European, British Ashkenazi and Mizrahi Jews, but also to differences between specific countries. So, for example, there were similarities between uh, uh, Polish Jews and Iraqi Jews, because both Poland and Iraq deprived Jewish migrants of their uh, of their citizenship when they had left those countries and went to Israel. So it was very difficult or even impossible to return to Poland and to Iraq. So here we have a similarity between those two countries. Another example is the comparison between Morocco and Romania. Um, um, because of various reasons, immigration from those two countries involved family separation. So families uh, uh, from, both, from both from Romania and, and Morocco were torn, were separated as a result, as a result of immigration, immigration to Israel. So one of the main reasons for return migration to those two countries was the desire to reunite with family members abroad. So again, we see similarity between uh, the patterns and reasons for immigration, for immigration from Israel to Romania, Romania and, and Morocco. Um, so I think this answers, it is partly answers your, your question that the differences are not, not always uh, based on the larger difference between Ashkenazi and Mizrahi Jews, but to differences between the patterns of migration from specific countries in both both in Europe and the Middle East and North Africa. Yeah, that's really fascinating, kind of how the, the analogs and the differences play out kind of differently than we might expect. And uh, I think this more or less brings us to the end of our time today. So I want to thank you again, uh, Professor Hudai, for joining us. And I want to thank also the audience um, for their engagement and their excellent questions. I invite you to join the Nazarian Center for its next event on Tuesday, May 17th at 10 o'clock in the morning, California time. Uh, Dan Rissenier, the designer of Israel, which is a lecture on one of Israel's most significant graphic designers and artists. So my thanks again and be well, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Avery. Thank you everyone for your questions.